It is a joy to present to you Mr. Adam Hart Davis. Mr. Adam Hart Davis has been invited here because he is a member of the British Toilet Association. He was in fact just giving me some tips for our straw bale urinals. Apparently we've got the bales turned the wrong way. Um, he's also a member of the Association of Pole Lathe Turners and just described himself to me uh, as a professional layabout. Of course, some of you might also have seen Adam on the telly, but uh, <laughs> obviously that's not as important as these uh, other associations. So I'm going to say nothing more other than the fact that Adam has been a huge supporter of Practical Action and of this event and turns up religiously to every festival and we're so grateful uh, for him taking the time to be here with us this weekend. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can you hear me without the mic? Okay. Yes. Good, then I'll talk without you. Did you use the mic? Because I'm recording the same. Is that right? <laughs> I'm always wrong. Whatever I do is wrong. Right, I'll use the mic. If you can hear me with the mic, so much the better. Anyway, it's a real pleasure to be back, and I love working with Practical Action. And uh, a few years ago, they took me out to Kenya to show me some of the work they're doing there, and it was absolutely fascinating. This was about... Uh, reduction of smoke inhalation. Uh, smoke, uh, breathing in smoke kills more people than malaria or, or all the other AIDS, all the other things you hear about. And so re reducing that is an enormous benefit. And then there was a micro hydro project, which was wonderful, a, um, various uh, projects in Nairobi, uh, and particularly the work they're doing in the slums for better toilets and so on and so forth. I found it absolutely fascinating, and it opened my eyes, and so I'm always willing to help if I can. And today I thought I'd tell a little personal story. Now, I live in South Devon, between Ivy Bridge and Ermington, if you know that part of the world, or 10 miles this side of Plymouth, if you don't. And I live right beside the River Erm in a converted barn. And it's an upside-down house with all the bedrooms at the bottom and all the living space at the top. And the river is that far away from the house. And every morning we look out of our bedroom window, my wife and I, and we look over the river to the field opposite, and it's a beautiful view, and every night we're lulled to sleep by the sound of the river going past. Until the 7th of July, eight weeks ago today, when we were woken at five in the morning by a rather more ominous sound of water coming into the bedroom. And we looked out of the window, and instead of being two and a half meters below the bedroom window, the river water was actually against the bedroom window. And, and this is slightly worrying. And the river is an enormous, instead of being a quiet little stream, it's an enormous roaring torrent. And the water was coming in through some hole somewhere, and then it poured over into our garden, uh, over the low wall there, and then it was coming in under the door. And so uh, Sue said, uh, wake up, Adam, this is serious. So I said, yeah. And we gathered armfuls of clothes, and we wandered down the passage, and it's about, I don't know, 10 meters down the passage and up the stairs, and we dumped the clothes anywhere we could, kitchen table, sofas, anywhere. And... It became more and more interesting walking down this passage. It's almost dark at five in the morning. And the carpet that was laying on the floor began to float as the water rose. And as you tried to step into it, you were tripping over the edge of the carpet. And then all the little gripper rods that were meant to be holding the carpet down were then floating about. And they've got nails sticking out of them. I had crocs on, but she had bare feet. And so it was quite hazardous, quite hazardous. Anyway, for half an hour, we moved all our clothes out. And then the water came up. It came up just high enough in our ensuite bathroom that the loo seat was just floating. <laughs> and by then it had ruined, uh, well, all the cupboards and our bed. I'd got the bedding off, but we couldn't get the mattress out in, in time. And so the mattress went, and we saved almost all our clothes. And various things were on the floor, which suffered a bit. Unfortunately, all the other bedrooms were filling up at the same time. And by the time we tried to get into the next one, the carpet had come up and the door wouldn't open. And so we couldn't do anything about the other bedrooms. We just had to wait and hope. And about an hour later, it was absolutely astonishing. The water was going down by then. It came up very fast, went down quite fast. And neighbours came round at seven in the morning. Are you all right? Can we help? And six of them, more than 20 neighbours came and offered to help. We didn't ask anyone, they just turned up and said, can we help? 
and six of them stayed for most of the day. And as the water went down, they swept it out with brushes out of the rooms. Uh, they ripped up the carpets. All the carpets were sodden. Everything underneath was sodden. And ripped up the carpets and pulled them out and took them outside and so on. They were absolutely marvelous. It, it made a huge difference. Um, we were pretty tired, as you can imagine, having been woken up at five, and we worked solidly most of the day. And by about four in the afternoon, we were reeling. Um, but the neighbors somehow went on and on. And then, the, as a final touch, two of our, one of the nearest neighbors, went out and got fish and chips and brought them to us at eight in the evening. And we sat, there's a lovely picture of me sitting there with a glass of wine and fish and chips, looking absolutely shell-shocked. Now, there are a lot of questions to ask about this. Um, first of all, we were enormously helped by the neighbors and by ourselves. Some other people who lived close by, who were also flooded, took the opposite line. The first thing they did when they realized there was water coming in was to ring the fire brigade and demand that they should come and pump the water out, which indeed the fire brigade did. I was very impressed. The fire brigade turned up and pumped all the water out. And then the next thing these people did was to ring the environment agency and demand that they do something. Well, there's not much you can do when the river is two and a half meters above normal, but they wanted they to do something. They didn't want to do it themselves. They wanted them to come and help. And it seems to me that we can't afford to expect that all the time. We can't afford to expect other people to rush to our aid, to author authorities, I mean, to rush to our aid when anything goes wrong. Uh, I think that's one of the... And that's one of the reasons I want to talk here, is that I think it's small-scale stuff that we need to do for ourselves and help ourselves if we're in trouble and organize things if we're not. Well, what's happened now is that um, we have two insurance companies, one for the building and one for the contents, because neither company would insure the whole lot. And they each have a loss adjuster, and these loss adjusters came in their suits and, went, and sucked their pencils and wrote notes. And then we have a surveyor, who one of them suggested we employ, they, they're paying, to come and decide what needs to be done and when. And then we have an engineer who's coming to decide whether there are structural damage or whether some of the walls are falling down or so on and so forth. And he is also talking to the loss adjusters. And then we have a builder waiting to come and do some of the work. But he can't move till he gets the go-ahead from the surveyor. And he can't move till he gets the go-ahead from the loss adjuster. And the loss adjuster's on holiday. So again, don't rely on the authorities. We need all these people. We can't go ahead without it. But we need to do whatever we can ourselves. Then we have an interesting problem with the floors. Most of the floors in our house, it turns out, are suspended floors. So at the bottom, there is concrete. It's an old barn, remember? So there is concrete at the bottom, which is presumably roughly where the floor of the old barn was. Then there is insulation about two inches, something like that, of insulation, probably polyurethane. On top of that, there is a damp-proof membrane, just a sheet of blue plastic to keep the water down. On top of that, there is chipboard, about half an inch of chipboard. Then there is underlay, and then there is carpet. And the water, of course, went all through all this lot, and so it's all soaking. And if you leave it there, you'll get mold growing, and you die of the mold spores. So everyone says, you've got to take it all out. So all that has been ripped out. And so all the floors now in all the bedrooms are concrete, but unfortunately, they've all got bathrooms attached. And in the bathrooms, there are cupboards that are mounted on this floor, there are skirting boards that are on the floor, there are um, uh, lavatories and showers and so on, basins all on top of the floor. The floor's got to come out, so all of this plumbing has got to come out, all of it, the whole lot, and probably the tiles off the walls. And if you think that it's an absolutely mammoth job and hugely expensive, I'm glad to say I don't think we'll have to pay for it. I think this is covered by insurance, but it's going to take months, probably a year. When it first happened, I said, oh, well, we'll be back to normal by Christmas. Now, this is eight weeks ago, the only thing that's happened is that we've had enormous industrial drying machines in there, and it's fairly dry, but nothing else, as I said, nothing can move until everyone okays it. I think it's going to be a year before we're back to normal. And the first thing we have to do is to decide what sort of floor to put down, because we don't want to do the same thing again. The chances are these events are going to get more likely. Let me diverse, divert for a minute and talk about global warming or, or um, climate change. If you remember, people started talking about this 20, 30 years ago. And when they said global warming, I thought, 
oh good, if it gets two or three degrees warmer, it'll be, it'll be like the Mediterranean. We can grow oranges and lemons and grapes and bananas and it'll be and olives. It'll be great. Of course, it's not quite like that. And then the scientists started saying, no, what's going to happen is we'll get more extremes of weather. More extremes of weather. And we said, oh, yes, more extremes of weather. And then suddenly it started. Do you remember the floods in Boscastle? Boscastle got flooded twice in successive years or something like that. And there have been an enormous number of floods in the last year. And this year, huge numbers of floods. And at the same time, tremendous droughts further south. Drought right across the United States. They've got terrible trouble with their crops. Drought across France. In Spain, there have been terrible bushfires in Spain. Terrible drought and heat in eastern India. And so much demand on the power that there was a huge power failure. Millions of people without power. And all of this in the last few months. And indeed, yesterday I heard this has been the wettest summer for a hundred years, the wettest for a hundred years, and the night before last was the coldest August night on record. So these are extreme weather conditions, and they're happening more and more often. Anyone camping here the night before last? Was it cold? Was it literally freezing? In some places, they were scraping the ice off their windscreens. I gather. I mean, it really. And this was August, you know, when it's supposed to be hot. This really is extreme weather. Well, I read a very interesting article uh, the other day by George Monbiot. It was in The Guardian last week. And he said that the Arctic sea ice has reached its lowest level ever recorded. All right? They've been recording the amount of sea ice. This is not the Greenland ice cap. This is the sea ice in the Arctic. And they've been recording the area of it from satellite photographs for the last 30, 40 years. And the amount, it, it gets less every summer and more every winter, for obvious reasons. It freezes and melts. And the minimum comes about mid to late September. Well, it's been getting less and less almost every year. And this year, it is now, there is now less sea ice in the Arctic than has ever been recorded. And we have not reached mid-September yet. This is only the 1st of September. So that's a serious change, a big change in the Arctic. Now, when the ice melts, all that energy coming in from the sun isn't reflected off the ice anymore. It's absorbed by the dark seawater. And therefore, the Arctic will heat up more than when it was ice on it. It's called positive feedback. With the ice there, the heat is reflected in space. Without the ice, it's absorbed. And therefore, you get the heating. It goes faster if the ice begins to melt. And dependent, to some extent, on that sea ice is the... Um, Put north, no, sorry, the North Polar Jet Stream. Now, 10 kilometers above the Earth, there's a jet of very fast air swirling round from west to east around the globe, more or less over our heads. And within this stream, and it, you may have encountered this, if you fly from here to North America, sometimes you're lucky and you get the jet stream behind you and you arrive an hour early because it speeds up the aircraft. And sometimes it's in your face and you arrive an hour late. This jet stream wobbles. It meanders from side to side like this. It's not steady. And because it normally meanders, we would expect in a normal summer to have a fair few hot days and then some thunderstorms, some days of great rain. But what's happened is because that sea ice has got so low, so, so, so little of it, the temperature in the Arctic has changed and the jet stream is fixed. It's not meandering so fast. And it has stuck at too low a level, too low a latitude. And the result is we are above the edge of the jet stream and we are getting essentially winter weather. That's why this summer has been the worst. If you noticed, four years ago, I think it was, we had a good summer. And then three years ago, it rained all July. And last day before, year, year before last, it rained all of June. And last year, and this year, it's been raining since April, almost continuously. We haven't had a hot week the entire summer. And that's because we're locked on the north side of this jet stream, where we shouldn't be. Meanwhile, on the south side, where again it's still locked, they're having all these terrible droughts and fires and so on. And it looks as though that is going to get worse. If the Arctic ice goes on melting at this rate from year on year, on year that um, polar jet stream is going to get locked in more random positions. And we don't know where it'll get locked. So, for example, this winter, we don't know whether we'll have a mild winter like last winter and it'll never get below five degrees, or whether it'll be an Arctic winter and we'll have snow and frost for weeks and weeks and weeks. We simply can't tell. 
and the meteorologists can't tell, and the uh, atmospheric physicists can't tell. It's all dependent on this jet stream, which is variable. But the point is that the scientists were right 30 years ago when they said extreme weather uh, events were going to get more common. That's almost certainly the case. It's almost certainly going to get worse, whatever worse means. OK, what should we do about it? Let's go back to my little story. What do we want to do about it? We want to arrange that we never have to dig up the floors again. We have to assume that this sort of flood will happen again. There is a farmer who lives just downstream from us who is my age, 69. He says he has never seen the river so high. So we can assume that this is a 100-year flood that happened eight weeks ago. Because if it hasn't happened in 69 years, it's something like a 100-year flood. But with extreme weather conditions getting more common, the chances are it will become a 50-year flood, a 20-year flood, a 10-year flood. So we have to expect that it will happen again. So what can we do about it? Well, first of all, we can build up the wall where the river came over into our garden and flooded through the doors. That's not going to be a huge job. It has to go up about a foot over a stretch of a couple of yards. Can, any competent builder can do that. There's another place where the water came in. We can build that up too. Uh, so with luck, we can keep most of the water away from the house as long as it doesn't get much higher. Then you can buy guards that you put across your doors. And um, you put a, a pillar either side and you slot a door in. And there are various ways of doing it. And they're supposed to be waterproof. And they go up to about 18 inches. You can't afford to do it higher than that. Otherwise, the pressure of the water will cause serious damage. Now, they're quite expensive. They cost three, four, five hundred pounds each, depending on the size of the door. And we're in a converted barn. We have 11 outside doors. Only eight of them are on ground level. But if you multiply eight times 500 quid, that's quite a lot of money just on something that might or might not happen. Then we can make our floors flood resilient. They can't necessarily be flood proof, but they can be flood resilient. So that if there is another flood, all we have to do is to go to the bedrooms, and chuck any rugs there are onto the beds, and when the water comes in, we sweep it out again. So it doesn't do serious damage under the floor. The river, and because our bedroom is half underground, it's very damp. It's very damp indeed. We've had, as I say, industrial um, dehumidifiers in there and fans for weeks and weeks. But I went in there yesterday for the benefit of this, this lovely slideshow I'm showing you now <laughs> and measured the relative humidity in our bedroom, and it's 88%. Now, that's pretty bad news. That's on a bright, sunny day, 88%. Clearly, it would be nice to get rid of some of that damp. And so what we would like to do is to install underfloor heating, of which there are now many systems. You basically you put insulation down, and then either electric wires, which is expensive, or pipes to take water, and you heat the water somehow, and then the floor is warm, and that warms the whole room. And you only need to warm it up to about 40 degrees, about blood heat, and then everything should feel warmer, and we should get rid of some of the damp. But, but... Can you install underfloor heating and then some um, solid floor like tiles or, or sheets of something or other on top so that it's waterproof, so that even if it floods, the water won't get in there and ruin the insulation and the pump? And we don't know. We've asked so far uh, three, four floor hooring experts, uh, one engineer, two engineers, um, one architect, and so on. And we ask them, you know, is it possible to do this? They don't know. They don't know. So we're still investigating. If anyone here is an expert on underfloor heating and making it waterproof, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. But that's our, those are our immediate goals, is to make a, a, keep wall some of the water out, and B, make sure that we've, we are flood resilient, that it doesn't matter if it floods again, or it doesn't matter much if it floods again. And there are other things we need to do as well. We discovered afterwards... Um, all the electricity went off instantly and the phones failed and so on. We got an electrician in a couple of days later to check and see whether we could switch on the, the power again. And he went round and he said, you were lucky, he said. Most of your sockets didn't get underwater. And um, he said, the service head. Now, the service head is where the main power comes into the house from the grid. It comes in at 100 amps. All right, and then it gets distributed into the little distributor board with all the, the um, uh, what are they called, RCDs? RCDs? Yeah, circuit breakers, right. 
uh, the water level came up to within a couple of inches of the service head. Now, if it had come in, if it had been two inches higher, the water would have been live, and we were wading through it, carrying our clothes upstairs. Uh, that wouldn't have been much fun. We would probably have been dead. So we'd rather not be dead. In particular, we thought it would be awful if one of us had got up the stairs and the other one went, ah, and died. <laughs> would, you rather, would you rather it was you or your partner, you know? <laughs> it's a horrible thought. So we're going to have all the electrics moved, including the service head, so that they're another metre up the wall. It's not difficult. It's just that the idiots who converted the house didn't think that it might flood. Um, it's hard to imagine these things when they haven't happened. We now speak with the benefit of some experience, and so we think we know what we need to do. So, why I'm telling you this long, boring story about what happened to me is that I think we need to think generally for ourselves. There are going to be more severe weather conditions. There are going to be more severe weather you know, effects of some sort. They may be floods, they may be storms, there may be drought. What do we need to worry about? My wife, I have to say, is a great doom monger, and she was convinced that the Millennium Bug would be a disaster. Who remembers the Millennium Bug? Yeah, some of you are probably too young to remember it. Everyone thought that when the time clicked over from 1999 to 2000, all the chips that had time things in them wouldn't understand and would stop functioning, and that all heating systems would fail and traffic lights, and it would be absolute chaos. My wife then worked at the University of the West of England, and they have enormous campus spread over miles and miles, and they had heating systems that went under the roads, and there were chips in these buried pipes, and they thought everything might fail, and the only way they could find out was to dig up the roads. Obviously, they couldn't afford to dig up all the roads to see whether it was going to matter, so they crossed their fingers like this. <laughs> Meanwhile, her elder son went to Cotton Grammar School, this was in Bristol, and um, she went to talk to the chap there who's in charge of the heating and they said are you worried about the millennium bug and he said what millennium bug and she said well how does your heating system work and he says come here and they went downstairs and there's the boiler and there was a switch that went off on <laughs> in a way low technology is wonderful it's really good it's not going to be a problem so for the millennium we collected mountains of stores very important baked beans rice all sorts of stuff we still got them sell by date 2001 it may be all right. And then you remember the bird flu scare. Everyone was going to die of bird flu. This was about five years ago. So we collected another load of stores, and we still got bird flu stores. And I think she'll now collect, you know, uh, flood catastrophe stores. And we'll, <laughs> goodness knows whether we'll eat them all. But actually, all that stuff is only short term. I mean, even our whole collected stores, we'd probably eat in a month. So that's not going to do if everything breaks down. She is convinced that things will break down, that money will break down, for example. If um, communications fail, and they may well fail, then all the hole-in-the-wall machines will stop working, and we won't be able to get money. There'll be no way of getting money, and we won't be able to pay for things in shops. And, of course, shops won't be able to function without the money. Then there will grow up locally sort of barter systems. You'll be able to take in your beans, if you've been growing runner beans, and swap them for loo paper or whatever it is you need more urgently than runner beans. But that's not trivial, setting those systems up, and it, it will be difficult. We luckily, in my village in Ermington, we have a thing called Sustainable Saturdays, where my wife is even at this moment selling runner beans and buying meat from somebody who keeps a farm up the road. And she's probably also buying some green vegetables from a guy who grows lots down the road. And there's a, a little barter all within the village, and money doesn't leave the village. It just changes hands, and people exchange what they've got. And, buy, and they, buy some, they sometimes buy my spoons. Last year, I sold £50 worth of spoons in a year. I'm a professional. <laughs> so that sort of system will have to um, spread if money fails. And of course, if money fails, then so will petrol. You won't be able to drive your car because you won't be able to get petrol. The petrol tankers won't run, or you won't be able to pay for petrol, and so we'll suddenly all be stranded. And if you've got a bike, good, that's great, because all you need is water, or Weetabix or something to power it with. Um, but you need to think about these things. What else is going to be serious? Well, food is obviously serious. What about water? I'm not bothered about water because we live by this river, and that's not going to stop. It's not very clean, but we can filter it. We can boil it. If we can uh, burn wood, we've got lots of wood. We can burn wood, boil the water. We're fine. But what if you don't? What if you live in a high-rise flat in the middle of Birmingham or somewhere? Not so easy to get water. And it's worth just thinking about these things.
what, what are the problems if the weather, weather got so bad that major systems started to break down? In the end, small will definitely be beautiful. We can't go on relying on everything. I mean, in the end, the internet will break down and you won't even be able to Google for this and that, which at the moment, how many people use Google? No, how many people don't use Google? Yeah, one. It, uh, I'm afraid it's become part of our lives. All us, all us old people, it's become even part of our lives. Um, yes, even that will fail in the end. And we have to think about a little bit of self-sufficiency and how we can organize ourselves in such a way as to survive even if things get very difficult. And I, was going, I had some cunning way of finishing with my pictures, and I can't remember what they were. So I will just say, ladies and gentlemen, don't take this sort of talk so seriously. It's not all going to be a disaster tomorrow or next week. It may not be next year. It may not be for another 50 years. But things are going to get worse on the weather front. We have to expect that. We're dead lucky today that it's not raining, but it's certainly not hot sunshine, which we might have expected at this time of year. And it may well be that next time it will be raining or even frosty. Or maybe we'll have a drought and all this ground will be parched and there'll be no water here. So just watch out. Be prepared for extreme weather and think about the consequences if that persists and is more widespread than it is at the moment. So thank you very much for listening to my tale. And do enjoy this thing. And I do recommend the, um, uh, the bus cafe, but I want to get there first, please. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. What an amazing speaker. You can see why he has been a star off the telly for so many years. Give it up for Adam Hart Davis. So um, he is up for taking some questions, and we've got another 20 minutes if people have any questions. Perhaps he's already answered anything. Oh, wait, we have a lady already. Okay, what's your question? Can you please talk a bit less loudly? <laughs> is that it? <laughs> Great, we can, we can do that, we can talk less loudly. Any other questions for Adam? <laughs> I talk too loudly. <laughs> Any questions at all? Okay, we have one here. It's not a question, it's a request. Tell us something positive. Something positive. <laughs> Tell you something positive. Oh, sorry, it was that too loud. <laughs> Um, something positive. Life is full of fun. I'm full of enthusiasm. I think it's great fun. I think, uh, you know, I was flooded. Am I in tears? Am I miserable? No. I look forward to this as a new challenge. It's quite interesting. It's a pity it's happened to us. It would have been better if it had happened to somebody else than I could just advise. As it is, you know, it's a new experience in life. It's a new challenge. And actually, the only way you get anywhere in life is by seeing challenges and opportunities and grabbing them. I've never ever decided what I want to do when I grow up, all right? But now here is something that I can do this take me one, two, three years, I don't know. I can make spoons and sort out my floors, I hope. Maybe there's some, maybe I can carve floors on it. Well, is that positive? Good, sir. Have you considered living on a boat? Have I considered living on a boat? Yes, I'm making an ark in the back garden. Um, <laughs> I have, actually, and my wife's former husband, Tom, lived on a boat for many years, and indeed, he was astonishing. He was a wonderful cook, and I saw him cook Christmas dinner for 11 people on a narrow boat. This was turkey and, uh, you know, uh, sausages and bacon and, and roast potatoes and sprouts, all the trimmings. I, I, those of you who don't know, the narrow boat kitchen is about the size of three of these straw bales. That's all the space here. Absolutely astonishing. Lovely bloke. He died last year, sadly. But no, I wouldn't want to live on a boat because I'm too untidy. I spread stuff all over the place. And also, you know, in winter when it's frosty and uh, it's all a bit... The inside, it's fine, it'd be warm, but outside it'd be all the icy and horrible. So, no thanks. But I have thought about it. Yes? Um, I was wondering uh, how likely you think it is to fix global warming rather than having to adapt to it. Oh, how likely are we to be able to fix it? 
I think it's very unlikely we'll be able to fix it uh, because, you know, politicians have been saying, yes, yes, we're the greenest uh, place in the world for 30 years, and they've done absolutely nothing. They've done absolutely nothing about it. So I think political will is not there. There are enormous engineering fixes which have been suggested. For example, if we float a million uh, shiny helium balloons in space to reflect away a lot of the sun's uh, light so it doesn't get to us and we live in more or less permanent cloud, that might do it. It would be hugely expensive. It might not work, but it's a possibility. Another possibility is to chuck a lot of iron salts into the middle of the Pacific, and that encourages the growth of algae. You get huge algal blooms, and they soak up CO2 from the atmosphere and so on and so forth there are many sorts of things suggested i don't think any of those is realistic and i don't think the governments have the guts to go say go ahead and do it um, so we'll never find out so i think we won't fix it we'll go on talking about it and some minor attempts will be made uh, and you know some people just build a lot of windmills which frankly are a waste of time um, but or, and a waste of money too uh, but yeah, sorry about that. I just don't think they are worth it. If you wanted to replace our, let us say, our coal-fired power stations by windmills, you'd have to cover, we'd have to have eight windmills on this uh, field and ten on that one. It would be solid wall-to-wall -wall across the country. And, and even then, if the wind stops, well, the lights go out. I mean, it's not practical. It's not practical. Yes, madam. Like, local, or how do you see that? I, I, uh, but now that's a very complicated because she says, given there's no uh, political will to bring about, uh, to combat climate change, how do I see governance changing? I think it's going to change quite a lot, actually. I think we're seeing all that with the Arab Spring, all right? That's, that's partly about different sorts of Arabs fighting against one another and repre thro overthrowing repressive regimes, but it's also partly about government from the ground up, from the people up. It's real democracy. Whether it will settle down as real democracy is not clear yet at all. I mean, you look at the trouble they're still having in Libya and Egypt and so on and so forth, and Syria. Um, but the fact is, it's, the pe it's people power. It's not people coming in with tanks and taking over. It's going out, coming from the ground. And that may happen more and more. It looks as if there's more and more trouble in Russia now. They don't like Putin. Uh, you know, they're making more and more row. Look at the P Pussy Riots trial. You know, it's caused a lot of tr trouble around the world for Putin. And people don't like him at all. And the Americans, I don't want to say anything against the Americans. I think their political system is complete nonsense. When they, when they, when the Republicans open their mouths, you know, you, 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 you just don't want to listen, really. I mean, it's just such nonsense. You, would you like Mitt Romney as the most powerful man in the world? <laughs> oh, sorry, you're American. Uh, yes, but, yeah, I mean, I mean it, it seems to me the Americans have to realize they want real democracy. They don't want to start with billionaires and then, you know, see who's got the, the most expensive... Uh, uh, not, not go there. <laughs> but I think, I think politics will probably slowly change because I think people will get more and more worried about what's going on and will make more fuss and eventually the governments will change. That's partly what's happening with our system. All that row about the coalition, that's partly because it's pressure from below that they don't know what to do. And it's not clear at all what to do. You know, they're, they're trying to be nice to the Americans but not too nice and they're trying to you know, not intervene in Syria and so on and so forth. Sort of it's yeah, possible. It it's possible. But I, it's very hard to predict, and I hate politics, so I, I refuse to make any predictions. Any, yes? Right, population growth. Very interesting question. I've just read a book by Matt Ridley called The Rational Optimist, and I found that a very interesting book. It cheered me up quite a lot. I strongly recommend it, incidentally. Matt Ridley, The Rational Optimist. Now, he says, and I have subsequently read this elsewhere, that what happens is that when... Uh, the infant mortality is high, that is when most babies die, women go on and on having children to make sure they've got enough to support them in their old age. In this country, in the 1830s, infant mortality was 50%. Of all the babies who were born, only half lived to be five years old. I and mean, it was awful. Now it's less than a tenth of a percent. But it's still more than 10% in a number of countries. In, in Mexico, in Bangladesh, and in a number of African countries, it's more than 10%. Now, when it's more than 10%, women see their children dying, and they go on having babies. 
when that cuts down to say 5%, women realize they don't need to have all those babies and they stop having them. It's partly to do with education, it's partly to do with emancipation of women, it's partly to do with the availability of birth control, but the fact is that the birth rates drop off when the death rates of infants drop off, so the birth rates drop off. And in many, many countries, and I can't now remember them by, um, you know, by name, the birth rates are dropping off. So it does look as though the world population will top out at about 9 billion. It's terribly hard to make predictions. And in some countries, it's still growing. Uh, in India, it's still growing. But you know, in other countries, it's coming down. And it looks as if it'll top out. Now, people say we can't fully feed 9 billion. Well, they say we couldn't feed 3 billion, and then we couldn't feed 6. And actually, agriculture seems to be able to, technology seems to be able to catch up. So let's hope, let's hope that it really does top out. And w w women really are able to stop having babies when they see their kids not dying. I ha that's my hope. Now, there was a question. Yes, sir? Yeah, given the fact that major climate change is almost inevitable, Thing, do you think there are things that government can do, could do, to make the country more resilient to these changes? Right, that's a very interesting question and hugely wide. He says, given that climate change is inevitable, other things the government could do to make the country more resilient. Um, yes, I think so. Um, I think, for one thing, the government has, all governments for the last 20 years have ignored the energy crisis. We've got a real energy crisis. The demand for energy in this country is going up about 1% a year, partly because there are more of us, partly because we get more and more of these gadgets. We get more and more mobile phones, iPhones, iPads, i this, i that, all of bigger tellies, all of which want more power. And the demand goes up about 1%. Decommissioning nuclear power stations and coal-fired power stations, and in about 10 years, the lights are going to go out. They finally noticed that, and they finally said, anyone want to build a nuclear power station? And of course, people aren't rushing in because nobody knows if there's money in it. We desperately, desperately need more power stations, and in my view, we need more nuclear power stations. Everyone says, oh, it's dangerous, it's dangerous. Well, the total number of people killed in all the nuclear accidents in the world so far is 58, right? That's about the same number of coal miners who die every year in China. It's about the same number of people who die on the roads in this country every day. You know, it's not that dangerous. I agree there's horrible problems about what to do with the waste and so on and so forth, but it doesn't, nuclear power does not kill people in the way that coal power does. Coal power is absolutely lethal. Huge numbers of coal miners die every day. So we badly need to build more nuclear power stations. That's a backbone, right? Then I'm all in favor of major um, renewables. So I would build the seven barrage at once now. That would supply, it's something like a 20th of the, all the power the country needs. It will change the ecosystems. It might possibly drive out the lesser, lesser spotted liverwort. Tough, tough. I think we need the power more than we need the lesser spotted liverwort. So that's one thing. If we had a reliable source of power, then we would be able to cope with a lot more of the other stuff that's going on. I think they should stop pussyfooting about with, let us say, the reform of the House of Lords when they can't decide what they want to do with it anyway. Uh, you know, they spent weeks and weeks debating it. They should stop banning um, hunting, for example, or, you know, fox hunting. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Let's start worrying about the things that really do matter. Let's start growing more of our own food. Let's stop growing oilseed rape all over the country and let's grow more wheat that we can eat and, and stuff like that. I, I was absolutely delighted that a week before last I was in Herefordshire and I'm delighted to see that a whole lot of new orchard of, orchards have been planted there. People are growing a lot more fruit, just apples and pears and stuff, because they're really useful. It's really nice to grow our own and not fly them in from Nigeria or whatever it is. So that, that's the sort of thing. I would like to go slightly back to basics, not try and make everyone self-sufficient, but a little bit back to basics and supply us with our energy. We need the energy. Individual people can't make their own energy. The government has to organise that. Oh, sorry, I've talked enough about that. I don't really know the answer to your question. Yeah, chap on the end there, and then you, madam. Forgive me, but listening to you, uh, there's a room full of activists here who think that small activist things are good. What I've heard you say is massive projects like the Seven Barrage, nuclear power with multinational companies coming in and saving us, governments doing something, and the rest of us might as well just protect our houses from floods 
and make spoons. And I'm just I'm a, bit, a bit provocative here, but what are you actually saying <laughs> to this group? Is it just like, give up, give up all your small activism? This is not going to make any difference. Live life and enjoy it. I mean, what are you saying? Right, that's a perfectly good question, and I, I agree. I've probably contradicted myself, and my, my philosophy is very unclear, and I admit that I'm not sure about it. What I'm saying is we need big projects for power. You may be a brilliant activist, but you are not going to build a nuclear power station in your back garden, I predict, right? That's, a, I think, a fairly safe prediction. You're probably not even going to set up a microhydro scheme. I have just... You are? Good. Good. I have just attempted to set up my own microhydro scheme because we live by a river. We paid a fair amount of money for somebody to come and survey it, and in the end, it's not quite worth it because the river, we don't have a fall in the river. We have a lot of little rapids. And, you know, in principle, we could generate 68 kilowatts, which would be wonderful, but it would cost three quarters of a million to set the plant up, you know, and that's not the sort of money I have lying around. So, yes. If you can set up small microhydro projects, if you can set up small projects like that, yes, even a small windmill, a small windmill is enough to power a boat, that would be fine. But, but we do need a major sources of power. I'm not longing for multinationals. I'd be very happy if it was a nationalized company doing the uh, nuclear power stations. We do need the power. I agree. I started this talk by saying it's no good expecting them to help. And on the whole, that's true. I don't want them to help individuals. I want them to provide a background, let us say, of power from which we can draw and then build our own things. I'm strongly in favor of, for example, growing your own veg. Um, it was quite interesting. Our veg garden was flooded to a depth of about 18 inches. And all the raised beds that I made, all the wood just floated away sideways like boats. When it, water went down again, we put all the the raised beds back, and all the veg were wonderful, not damaged in any way. We had wonderful lettuces. They were all a bit gritty because, of course, the water had settled with all the river grit on top. They all had to be washed rather carefully. But apart from that, no damage whatever, and, and it's been growing like mad ever since. The only thing we lack is sunshine. It would be very nice if we could generate sunshine, wouldn't it? Has anyone had good tomatoes this year? Oh, really? Well, nearly. <laughs> yeah, getting there. No, we should have had them for... Yeah, we should have had them for a month, shouldn't we, by now? And the beans. We've got enormous bean plants and about half a dozen beans on them. And a whole lot of things. Very, very poor. We need sunshine. So, but we can't generate that, sadly. Yes, sorry, no. You had a question. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's a complicated question. What you're saying is there's, uh, there is still increasing population, there's increasing wealth, so everyone has more money, but no, notably the Chinese. This is, this is very remarkable. Uh, they started eating meat sort of 10 years ago, and now they're consuming enormous quantities of it. But also, they all want TVs and iPhones and, and uh, cars and all that sort of stuff. I was in Mumbai in uh, January. And it's absolutely terrifying. It's a huge city. Um, the last time I was there, which was 50 years ago, the, almost the only form of transport was the bicycle rickshaw. Now there are um, motorized rickshaws, but almost everyone has a motorbike. And they all want cars. And so there are millions, millions of people on the roads. And they don't, well, they, they may have traffic laws, but I have a photograph of a crossroads, major crossroads in the middle of the city, with traffic going in all four directions at the same time. And if there's a gap between two cars going that way, a motorbike will go through it. Absolutely terrifying. Now, as they all get cars, of course, they're pumping out more and more CO2, and they're using up more and more resources. And I don't think there's any way of stopping them. There's no way of saying, uh, we've created this problem, so you mustn't have cars. You can't have washing machines. You can't have tellies. You know, we can't do that. We have to find ways of making all these things which use less uh, energy, and we have to find ways of generating enough energy so they can do it. Indeed, they have to generate their own energy. I don't think there's any way of going backwards. It would be nice to think that we could all go back and be self-sufficient and not use, but, you know, how many people would willingly throw their tellies away or stop using their cars? Very hard to persuade people to do that. Very difficult. And it hurts quite a lot if you're used to, you know, driving your kids to school, suddenly they've got to walk. 
Uh, it would be very good for the kids, of course, having to walk to school, but sadly, people think, oh, they're going to get raped, they're going to get abducted. So, yes, right at the back. China, more than two and a half billion people live. America, which is less than 25%, you know, one-fourth of the world, producing up one-fourth of the world's energy with less than 3% of the yeah. world's population. So, so just, just the way it's being framed is slightly interesting. Um, washing machines, televisions, and the that kind of stuff which is being used up. Uh, it's quite a bit of it is a dump from the West which goes on towards northern country, uh, from the north to the southern countries. So, yes. So, I'm not very sure whether framing it in nationalist terms, you know, us and them works very well because climate change, something we do in the in India affects affects England or in America. So this the entire debate somehow has been framed in a very national us, UK, America, China, India. I'm not sure if climate change works in those terms. No, I climate climate change is obviously worldwide. Um, but some of the consequences are, are interesting. Um, my wife said with some friends in, in America recently, in Colorado, they went skiing and they have an enormous SUV, you know, a sort of car like this. You had to climb up a ladder to get into it. And uh, my wife foolishly said, I'll pay for the petrol. And they went, they went to the gas station and they started going in and it was 50 gallons, 60 gallons, 70 gallons, 80 gallons. She thought, my God. And the bill was $15, 15. So it's ludicrous. If, if the Americans increased the price of their fuel by a factor of 10, they would stop driving enormous vehicles and it would stop some of the... At the moment, all the American dollars, of course, are going to China to pay for the clothes. And the, so the Chinese are getting richer and richer, Americans getting poorer and poorer. And that's nothing to do with global warming. That's just the way the people are. But Americans are encouraged to believe that everything is cheap. And unfortunately, that's not going to last forever. So that's one of the reasons why I think that the politics may start from the ground up, that it may start to uh, come to Americans that actually it's not quite as... So, no, I don't want to be nationalistic about it. Um, and uh, India, of course, is an enormous, you know, it's so, changed so much. In, I was there 50 years ago. I was there this January. And the change is absolutely phenomenal. I'm just sad to see they're all on motorbikes, you know. <laughs> this point is a political point. The problem with activists, you know, like yourself, you, you making, uh, you know, power generators in the back, uh, living by a river, growing roses. Most people in India live in a square room with 10 people in, 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 you know, staying in. Yeah. So this kind of activism is not even possible. No. Half the, half the population is just trying to survive. But the, aston difficult. the astonishing thing is that even if they are living in a, beside the road, I've seen them living beside the road in Mumbai, the, the women and the kids are beautifully turned out. The kids go to school. It's absolutely astonishing. Yeah. They, that's, the, that's a different conversation. All right. It's not about climate change. No, it's not about climate change. But it seems to me that the Indians would be good at coping if things they go are. wrong. They yeah. Are. They are. Now, there was another question here somewhere. Can I just say yes. Last question. Last question. I'm yeah, I'm talking too much. Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. Man with hat. Yeah, it, it, for me, the issue is, about, is, more that, is capitalism going to kill us before climate change? Kills us. I mean, to me, like climate change is being accentuated by the, the idea of growth and a profit dynamic. Because, like, oh, everyone wants a car in, in India or China, but if they built really good public transport systems, you wouldn't need cars. But because the car industry is so massive, you know, it all comes back to unequal distribution yes. of power and resources. Yes. And to me, you need a leveling yep. of, of power and resource. So, how do you do it? Well, uh, that's social revolution. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, right, but, politics from the ground up. Yes. Yeah. But the trouble is, I mean, you take this country, for example, I would agree with you. I think if we had really good transport system, we would not all need cars. But there's been huge encouragement since after the war. The car was freedom. And everyone could buy a car, and then you could afford to live 30 miles from your work. So everyone commutes 30 miles twice a day. And you know, some people commute 100 miles twice a day. And, and then... You can't suddenly say that the people aren't going to say, oh, we don't need our car, I'll walk 100 miles twice a day. It can't be done. And therefore, we've now stepped beyond where it's possible to go back easily. In fact, it's very difficult to go back easily. I would quite like to live in my own little patch, grow most of my veg, carve my spoons, and not actually go anywhere. In fact, it's stupid of me to come all this way and bore you lot, isn't it? I could have stayed at home and bored my cabbages. It would have been just as, 
just as effective. Sorry, I don't want to... I think I'd better stop digging now. I've got the bottom of this hole. Thank you very much indeed. Adam Hart Davis, everyone. Thank you so much.